if I was a road sweeper, the roads would be spotless. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do when I am having a stressful day is just strum away, so they say. And on that note, I believe my guest is here. Now, I like to refer to him as Captain Nature. And I believe his bandmate, Chrissy Hind, likes to refer to him as that as well. And we can talk to him about that in a bit. Uh, but you might know him as the drummer in The Pretenders, um, who have had hits like Don't Get Me Wrong, I'll Stand By You. Um, please welcome to Life in Six Strings, the wonderful Mr. Martin Chambers. Martin, how you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm completely uh under the weather with work outside because it's raining and it's uh there's an awful lot going on where i live so as you know it's just maintaining an even strain at the moment kylie you are always a busy bee aren't you i love it and i know we had a little chat earlier ahead of this interview just to get our heads around zoom and stuff and i've got to say i'm just going to put my glasses on for this one because i need to take a proper look at you you're looking very suave mister i like that you shaved for me well i've shaved that horrible goatee thing off and everything that was going on and I actually cut my hair and had a luxurious bath. Did you cut your own hair? I have done for 25 years. Oh you're so amazing. This is what I love about you. That's great. I'm self I'm self-sustaining. That's the idea of individuals. You don't rely on pushing buttons or whatever. Just do it yourself. See, this is why I call you Captain Nature because you are all about that, aren't you? You know, you are very um, shall we say, conscious of the environment and what's going on in the world and how we're destroying it. And, 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 and that's what I love. You play a part in doing something great. Yeah, you, you, I think a very wise thing, and he said a few of them was Timothy Leary, and he said, think global, act local. Because ultimately, that's all you can do as an individual, unless you're a big conglomerate, then you can really screw it up uh, in a big, big way, you know. I mean, that is like the the kind of the heart of the pretenders in a way, because I know Chrissy is the same, isn't she? Do, was that something that you always had an interest in? Or is it something that you just as you've got older and you've grown up and you've realised actually we need to protect this, this planet? Well, two things, you know, I came from this part of the world uh, in the wild west of England and... Um, I'm a country person, uh, you know, if you don't understand what you're standing on, and I don't mean the concrete or the tarmac or yeah. plastic or whatever, if you don't understand the earth, you're not gonna get very far as a human being. You should have some knowledge of what's going on and therefore understand why there are problems. And when you travel the world in a band, you get to see a lot of things firsthand. And uh, a lot of it's not very nice. Really, uh, like what? Well, we, we were in, um, uh, I was with Chrissy actually in uh, the South China Sea and we called in loads of places, Borneo and Singapore and uh, Borneo specifically, you think of Borneo and you think of these pristine beaches and stuff, it was just full of plastic everywhere and no birds, hardly any birds at all. Really? Just very sad, you know, and that's reality. And where I live in the countryside here, you notice what's going on when two pairs of swallows arrive when nine years ago you get eight pairs of swallows. Well, that's what I noticed. That's what I noticed during lockdown. It was like all of a sudden, all the animals were coming out again. And I live in London. And it's like my garden would all of a sudden be just be lots of birds in there. And well, the difference, the difference between the lockdown and hearing the birds, and then not hearing the birds, but they were there all the time. You couldn't hear them because of the traffic. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. It, feel, it feels really weird doing this lockdown because what I've done for fifty. How long has it been now? 53 years I've been playing the drums. Uh, and I've yeah. played the drums for that amount of time. And that's what I've done. I've had odd jobs in the early days to earn a bit of money and get a car and get around. But, you know, it's it's an odd profession. It's uh, in, in one respect, it's very eye opening. And, and in another, it's unreal. You know, you have to decompress when you come back, you know. How do you decompress? I mean, I've always wondered that about musicians. Does it take you a bit of time to sort of, when, you, when you've been on like a... That's how I decompress. Oh, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Look at that. That's it, you know, it's countryside. It's. 
I mean, that completely yeah. strips it all back, doesn't it? You're on this big whirlwind of tour and going from here and there, and then you come back to that and you're like, wow, this is just everything stripped back, nature. That's why I live here now. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm globally aware and I do read articles that are brought to my attention. I don't read newspapers at all, although I go to articles because it's been pointed out or I found it or, um, and really that's it. You, you stay in touch with it, but I don't want to know. No. Because there's only so much I can do as an individual. So yeah. I try and do, I'm planting trees. I've got loads of trees to go in over that side. I've got a new building over there for the bats and the, uh, the Barn Swallow Hotel, which is first class. Uh, and, uh, you know, the cider press goes, the old 1840 cider press goes underneath. Uh, and it's all, you know, I'm moving into this build, which has been here for hundreds of years, and it's housed lots and lots of different creatures, including now seven species of bats. So do something for them before you kick them out. And what drummers did you look up to when you started playing? Uh, well, because my father was a jazz player, he, he always had, I had music in the house. So thanks to my mother and father, I listened to all sorts of bands and um, uh, Buddy Rich was high on the list and Louis Velson from the big band era, um, coming right through to, uh, Elvin Jones uh, and all sorts of drummers that had their own thing. And that's the key to being a musician. If you can find your own thing, if you're a vocalist, you find your voice and you sing great. And if you're a drummer or a guitar player, you find what it is that you do. Uh, and then you're an individual. You're not just copying people, which is to me pointless. So uh, it was great, but Buddy Rich, of course, because he was so in your face, he used to have fights with Sinatra and stuff. And I, I met him a few times and saw him many times. Uh, Did playing. you? Yeah. We wow, played what was, what was I, it played, like? I played on stage with Buddy Rich. Did you? That must have been incredible if he was a hero of yours to finally get to play with him. I was on my honeymoon, so what better thing to do? I've been, I've been to Rome and then the second half was LA and I was um, asked by my drum manufacturer at the time, Ludwig Drums, to, uh, to score... Um, the winner of a competition and the big final was held at Griffith Park in LA and the judges were there and I was sitting next to Buddy Rich on the grass and talking to Kathy's daughter and um, who I saw recently at Ronnie Scott's club because she was yeah. doing a big band thing for Buddy and keeping his name going and I found him absolutely fabulous you know just and a player I mean it's just staggering player um, Ian Pace was doing that night, and uh, the drummer from Deep Purple, who I admire greatly, he's a, yeah. a terrific player. And um, he was doing the big band thing, stepped in and did a uh, and did half an hour with them, and it was great to watch. And Ian's particularly good. So everybody, really, you watch everybody, you end up with a few favourites. I mean, Charlie Watts does Charlie Watts mm -hmm. like nobody else. Ringo Starr does Ringo Starr like nobody else. You put Ringo Starr with the Rolling Stones and you put Charlie Watts with the Beatles. What do you got then? <laughs> That's no, why I, I guess they're, they're from different um, schools, aren't they? Like you say, whether you're from the jazz or you're from like maybe more of a blues. Yeah. Or... And, and if you look at that, you get the angle of the stones and the riffs. Yeah. Da, 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 da. You know, it's all a bit angular. And then Charlie comes in and just swings it out. and. You know, and, and Ringo just swings, man. His right hand is the best in the business, always was, uh, to play those sort of great hits and all those. I mean, just innovative as well, you know, great writing, yeah. great innovation. So you met, you know, you, you mentioned the whole jazz thing and that was kind of what inspired you and got you going. What is it about you great drummers that have this jazz influence? Like if you look at Ginger Baker, he, he that's what he started as. Um, or you look at someone like Neil Kirk from Rush. He actually went off and then completely retrained and, and mm. went into the school of jazz and stuff. Well, what is it about jazz that kind of somehow molds with rock music? I think because of the age of rock and roll now, there were a lot of people that were older than me. Uh, you know, I was born at a time and there are, we're talking about people born before me. There yeah. was no rock and roll. Rock and roll didn't exist. Yeah. That's when I was born. It happened that I was born a few years before it kicked in, four or five years, you know. These guys were already involved in the latest music, whether it was Skiffle or whatever it was. But jazz was the more serious stuff, and that's why a lot of these people who are older than me were into that before it developed into rock and roll, and that was the more groovy thing to do. 
-hmm. And so in their late teens, early 20s, these guys, when I was still, what would I have been, 10, they were getting serious about what they did. Uh, and then they all happened, for one reason or another, to be uh, in the company of the people that would be the band. The yeah. Stones met, you know, it, that that is a really fascinating way how people meet. It's incredible because you've got some great friends in the industry and you have all kind of just, you know, you've been on this like this roller coaster together, haven't you? I mean, when we first met, I mean, we met, what was it, in 2014? We met at the Classic Rock Awards, didn't we? Uh, yeah, 2013, I think it was. So that's when you, 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 you weren't in The Pretenders at that time and you were playing with uh, Mott the Hoople, weren't oh, you? No, The Pretenders weren't touring. They weren't, were they? No, no true. No. That was all on hold and uh, I got the call from some friends of mine because I know them all anyway because of the condition that Dale Griffin was in, Buffin, and uh, so we managed to get him on stage in 2009 but uh, unfortunately 2013 there's no way but you know that was a great thing for me because I knew them so well and it was a beautiful thing yeah. to see them hanging out again for the first time after all those years because you know I just sat there and watched it all because I knew them they put us on um, when I was in bands in the late 60s, early 70s, when they started uh, and became this phenomenal live act that everybody loved. You know, Queen supported Mott the Hoople. There's a whole point to that. They got turned on by the attack mm -hmm. that uh, was not, it wasn't uh, under control. They were, wow, it was just wild, natural. We're going for it. And everybody joined in. It was just like a riot. And we supported Mott the Hoople, I think, four or five times in those days. Right. And you learn a lot watching a band from the wings. You really do learn a great deal about your contemporaries. And they're just those years older. So it just helps you, pulls you up, you know. Well, do you know, it, it was pretty much a year ago this month that you and I were at um, Fleetwood Mac. Because you just, oh, support, you had just supported them, and we were at the side watching, watching them, and that, that was just yeah. incredible, wasn't it? And I've got a video of it with um, Mick Fleetwood getting off the drums, and he did this little dance at the yeah. end to everyone. And it was He's just a great like character. he taught me a great deal. There's another guy, you know. I used to see them in the club in Ross and Wye. I mean, Ross and Wye back in those days had probably four thousand people living in it, hmm. and they were playing. They had only just formed, and uh, Christine McVie was in the support band uh, at the time, and um, uh, and they played it. I'd rather go blind. She sang it, and I think the band played it with her, Fleetwood Mac. So that was the early part of Fleetwood Mac when Peter Green was there, um, Jeremy Spencer was there originally, then Danny Curran was there. And so Mick taught me a great deal because I could stand 10 feet from his drum kit, and it's right there, and I could see every little thing that was going on and what he was doing dynamically with the bass drum. I mean, it just. It, I, you suck it up. I would have been, uh, I would have been about 16, 17. Then. Oh my God. Okay. So you suck it up at that age and in the arts and certainly in music, you suck it up all the time. You're just, you know, devouring any information about what you love. Hmm. And my, I have quite a diversive love area. You know, I love nature. I love being alive, you know, make the most of it. And, and be good at whatever you do. If I was a road sweeper, the roads would be spotless. <laughs> oh my God, that's brilliant. Uh, why, why do something and do it badly? Is yeah, I'm you're saying. right. I get that. I get yeah. that for sure. Um, now I know you're a drummer, but you also sing and you play the guitar as well. Martin has a Martin. How's that coming along? Well, she's sitting right there, lying right next to me. Let's have a look at that beauty. Come on then, get her, pick her up. It's a 2008, well, I haven't really got much to say on it at the moment. I've got loads of ideas, but uh, it's just a really good guitar. You pick it up. This is a standard that most people who got to a great level have used over the years. You know, everybody. Yeah. And um, it's just really cool to, to strum away. You strum away pick up stuff and what I've done because I want to make an album I've made so many albums for everybody else um, I thought to myself why not make an album for myself and write yeah. some songs and make an album just try not to make it too smelly <laughs> so you know that's that's what you do because they're all the same chords so did you teach yourself yeah oh yeah because I tried to get somebody to give me lessons back in uh, when did I get my first guitar if you could call it a guitar 
um, uh, was great way back in probably 63, 4, around the Stones Beatles start, you know, everything. You've been playing that long, bloody hell. Well, no, the thing is, you know, I didn't get anywhere with it. And when the time came, there, this local band and I was doing nothing. Uh, said that uh, we need a drummer. I just said I was happened to be in the market hauling Ross on Y when it was said, and yeah. I said, "Oh, I can play the drums." I never even touched a real drum kit at that point. I no. just thought it was it seemed obvious to me that mo everybody can play the drums. Surely you just hit things, but you have to know what to hit and how it must sound so it fits with the music. So yeah. I didn't know all about that, but um, I found it easy and got into a into a band as a drummer, and then everybody else was a guitar player. So I didn't play for years and years and years. So was that always kind of like a secret, like burning ambition of yours? Um, well, it's a bit more, it can be more fulfilling. I mean, there's nothing quite like coming off stage totally exhausted uh, because you've given it your all on the drum kit. To yeah. Provide that platform upon which the butterflies can do it, you know. And the it's, def it's definitely is more physically challenging, isn't it, than the guitar, I think. Well, that's why I'm 161 pounds. I'm one pound overweight. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, you just got to stay in shape to do it the way I do it. I don't just sit around tapping things. It's a big journey for me. I have things sure. big. I like big places to play. I also like little clubs because, you know, back in the day, it smelled like tobacco and alcohol. And it's just like, that's good. It's just a great smell, you know? Mm, for sure. So, um, so you, obviously you know that I've been learning how to play guitar during lockdown as well. Uh, you, well, yeah. yeah I told you about that, didn't I? It, it's good, isn't it? My brother's got hold of uh, one of my guitars and he's kind of doing it to keep his fingers moving apart from anything else. Is he really? He's so he's taught himself as well? Well, he's doing whatever he's doing, but I said to just learn a couple of chords, you know. Yeah. And, and it only takes a couple. Ah, hey, man, take that gun off me. You know, I can't shoot straight anymore. And then you go, oh, daddy boy. And like, so no, just, uh, you know, they're all the same chords after all. Just get comfortable changing from chord to chord because when you first do things and you find a chord, got to get used to your fingers going automatically to that position yeah and yeah, i found that chord, point, isn't it? i have no idea what that chord is so it just it was a, it was a passing note kind of chord and um and then you have that one to refer to so you build up your little collection in my case in d so how does it make you feel like you talk about that and when you're playing and stuff, how does it make you feel when, when, when you are playing your instrument? Does it change your being, do you think, when you're playing? And, and, and I... Yeah, you definitely go somewhere. And that yeah. process is, I think, the same for all performers, whatever you're performing in, whether it's motor racing, tennis players, uh, snooker, badminton, it doesn't matter. When you're at the top of your game and you're, you know, you're fighting for the World Championship or whatever it might be, you have a process and you, you become aware of it over the years, but you don't really notice it. Okay, it's happening today. I've done all the work. I'm yeah. good, self-confidence, beef you up a bit. You get there, it's nerve wracking, but there becomes this process gets very finely tuned when your match is in an hour or your gig starts in an hour and you go into this thing. You don't really want to speak too much to people. I'm not too bad with it, but as it gets to half an hour, I change. I change clothes and that changes you. You're then into this mode where you're like, let me add them, you know? Yeah. All the nerves have gone and you're just excited, a little bit of anticipation, you know, uh, and you stand in the wings. And if you've got a good uh, uh, intro music, uh, as we had in the early 80s with um, the Apocalypse Now soundtrack, we edited stuff in with helicopters and all sorts of stuff from Apocalypse Now. And that one, when we were all completely bushed from the last 20 parties we've been to in the last 10 days, you know, you get there and suddenly the adrenaline kicks in yeah. and you're ready to go. And I warm up. I warm up for, when I change uh, half an hour before the gig, I've already stretched a bit. I put my big robe on to get a sweat up and I start running. It's like training, warming up for a boxing match. You know, you stretch. Mm -hmm. You do all sorts of exercises. So you walk out there sweating. Yeah, I get that's that. What, that's how I start the show. And then from there on, it just gets more and more and more. Yeah. 
Can, can, can you remember the first time that you heard a track or a band that completely changed your life and you were like, okay, this is it for me? This is well, believe it or not, I think I, it would have been 1957 or 58. And there was a guy called Johnny Duncan who covered the song in this country. I was under the impression it was actually Johnny Donegan. Maybe he did it as well, but yeah. Johnny Duncan did it. And I think I heard the Johnny Duncan version first and it was called only 16 it was a sweet little song that was being played on the radio the car yeah. radio and i was on the beach and my father had just given me this line to catch crabs or whatever and suddenly this song came on only 16 only 16 but i love her so well and i heard that word he she was, was too young to fall in love and, and I, I was too young, young to to when i, I heard that when I heard that line, she was she was too young to fall in love and I was too young to know. It did something to me at the age of eight or whatever it was. And I, I knew that was important. I don't know what it was. And then within a couple of years, I was wandering around Ross at night time, which you wouldn't get today. I went down the cabin club and saw a band when I was about eight or nine years old. Yeah. The, the condensation on the inside of the glass. It was the cabin in Ross and Y. And the guy playing the bass was Pete Watts, who ended up in Mott. The drummer was Buffin, who ended up in Mott. Pat O'Donnell, who had a, a fist hand covered in a leather glove because he had polio. And they were doing um, um, the Johnny Kid and the Pirate song. And it was really like, oh man, whatever this is, I want to do that. So that was by, that probably would have been 61 or two or something around there. So I knew where, where I was headed, you know. Wow. Okay. Well, it's great, isn't it? And then you ended up with all those guys throughout your career as well. It's like you all started it's, together. It's a small community, the music community, really. When your band's on the road, you bump into people. You haven't seen them for 10 years and you can carry on the conversation about 10 years ago. It's yeah. just really quite small uh, in the rock and roll community and yeah. you know, proper music, R&B and, and all that great, great stuff that we've, we've ended up in this position now in 2020 which is incredible when you think uh, how long ago rock and roll came along. Well, who are you listening to at the moment? Because a band that you introduced me to that I've absolutely fallen in love with is Bones um, with um, Carmen Vandenberg on the guitar. I mean, incredible. She's exceptional. Guitar. She's an exceptional player because she is fed off everything. And she's yeah. with Jeff Beck and uh, Robert Cray. She's been on stage playing them as an equal and she's yeah. young. She's gorgeous. She plays guitar like a like a guitar should be played, but she does it her way. And she's got her thing. She's yeah. technically great. She's got a great ear. And uh, Bones for me had that new, exciting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping big things are going to happen with them. They're now located in, in LA, so hopefully no. something will happen there. But you know, there's lots of stuff out there. There's so much, you know, you can get hold of and look at stuff on the internet. Uh, but it's not like going. You hear it on the radio and you go to the club because they're playing there next week it's it's different now it's it's different that's how it used to be it was on the jukebox and you go right they're playing in cheltenham they're playing in gloss let's go and see them yeah you felt that need to to see what you hear mm, sure I know. Well, I'll be forever grateful for you putting me on to Carmen and, and Bones and stuff because... I'm, I have high, high hopes for them. It was great of Jeff Beck to take them on the Loud Hailer tour. Oh, my well God. Well done, Jeff. What a wonderful combination, those three together. I mean, incredible. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, listen, Martin, it was absolutely lovely chatting to you. It's so good to see your face. I know we've chatted on the phone, but, you well, know... It gives me an excuse to shave. I, mean, I know, just, right? About two hours ago, it was all kind of, you know, because I'm busy doing physical, manly work here yeah. uh, because uh, that's what I do and I love uh, the countryside and I'm trying to make a beautiful building in a beautiful place uh, last another couple of hundred years. Well you're doing a really good job thank you so much for taking the time to come on thank and you. I shall see you soon hopefully. Yes hopefully soon when everything's calmed down a bit.